joining us this evening. My name is Erica Hattori. I work for the Pittsburgh Photo Fair as well as Casey Drogi Cultural Productions. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight for our collector show and tell. Um, for all of you who may not be familiar with this event, uh, we started it last year um, as a result of the pandemic and we wanted to have like a nice like virtual interactive event in lieu of the fair which unfortunately was cancelled and thus the collector show and tell was born and this is our second one and we're delighted to have all of you here and all of our lovely speakers um so for tonight we are going to let's see what was i going to say so we're going to ask all of you to have your microphones muted um while the presentations are going on if i do hear like little bits of outside noise i'm going to go ahead and take the liberty of muting you, um, but you will be able to unmute yourselves um, during the Q and A's that will follow after each presenter goes and presents their photographs. Um, everyone will have three minutes each to talk about their photo. So it'll be a very like quick rapid fire kind of situation. So it's gonna be very fun and very uh, speedy. Um, I just wanna go over a few things about Zoom if anyone is not familiar. So at the top of your screen, you will be able to see some like view options. Um, there's like a little, tiny triangle that you can use and you can go between side by side mode or grid mode and either way you'll be able to see all of our lovely faces as we go through this event. Um, and just as a final note, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, this is a community space and just to be respectful of everybody and all the presenters who are going to be participating this evening. And let me see here. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Evan for a few words. Evan, you're muted, sorry. Rookie mistake, here I am. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to all of my fellow collectors and to our, and to our Zoom audience, which we are always grateful for your participation. Um, uh, Erica, would you like me to get started with my presentation or is this just the sort of welcome in? Speaking of muted. Exactly. Yeah, we can go ahead and start if you're ready. Okay, sure. All right, All yeah. right. so everyone, we're just gonna go ahead and get started. And our first presenter tonight is Evan. So Evan, I'm gonna start keeping time for you and you will have three minutes starting now. So I have a dirty secret and that dirty secret is that I used to be a violinist. I think some of you know that about me, but maybe not all of you. Um, and that definitely informs this part of my collection, but is not the whole story. Um, I think those of you who know me as a, as a person who's interested in contemporary art are probably not aware that the largest part of my collection is actually pictures of people with violins. And I have uh, a collection of over well over 2000 objects at this point. And um, this uh, collection has been compiled into a show which is going to uh, premiere a transformer station in uh, the beginning of 2022 in January. And it's curated by our very own Dan Lears. Um, and we are hoping that it will tour if there are venues that any of our lovely followers uh, can imagine that this would be a good show. I'm happy to help with that. But my two pictures that I chose, um, I chose because it shows the span of this topic. Um, and, and so the first picture is um, by uh, an unknown photographer, but certainly an extremely um, wealthy and, uh, and, and uh, privileged family that was able to commission um, what was for the time an extremely large scale uh, wet collodion print of their, of their well-heeled daughter with her violin. And the second picture, which is also using a 19th century process, but which I commissioned um, uh, this year in order to uh, really bring the whole collection full circle of from the beginning of photography in the 1840s to the present day, I commissioned Jerry Spagnoli to do a daguerreotype uh, for me. And we got the uh, up and coming uh, violinist Kevin Ju to pose for him with his 
with his Strad, which is on loan from a private collector. Um, and the, the whole point of the show is that the violin as an object spans every level of society, every geography. I have pictures from all over the world. It shows people using the violin to show how wealthy they are. It shows the violin being used to show how poor people are, to show how much they're from Arkansas, how much they're from Russia, how much they're from Hungary, how sophisticated they are in Japan for having Western instruments. It's just this incredibly flexible um, uh, icon. And I hope that if you are um, intrigued by the two images that we'll see you in Cleveland in January. And there's also, I think my camera is not on, but we're working on a book as well, which I think you can't see, but maybe in the Q and A we can, we can show it. Um, so we're looking for a publisher, but there is a, a lovely maquette that is in front of me that, uh, that we're hoping to find a publisher and have that in front of people too. So perhaps the next PGH photo in person, there'll be Evan's collection book for sale as well. All right, it's time now. All right, so Q&A is open for everyone. You can go ahead and unmute yourselves or you can write a question in the chat if you would prefer. Um, if you can't find the chat, it's at the bottom of the screen and there's a little window that says chat. So if anyone has any questions. Hey, Evan, this is Brian. <laughs> How many photographs will be in the exhibition? Um, we're still finalizing the exhibition list, um, but um, we're, uh, um, Dan is looking at somewhere between seven and 900. Um, uh, it's, um, it sounds like a lot, um, but there will be multiple shadow boxes that will have anywhere from five to 20 smaller uh, images in them. And so if you're talking about individual objects, it will be many fewer than 700. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of framed objects, but if you're, if you're, um, if you're counting actual individual pictures, it will be, it will be that many. Amazing. Thank you. All right. We have time to squeeze in one more question. If anybody wants to go. I'll ask a quick question. This is Christine. Um, do you still play? Um, never. And uh, that's that's purely for the pleasure of it. And I also I also like to say that my single greatest act of philanthropy was to stop playing. All right. Well, thank you, Evan. Um, so next up, we are going to move on to our next person presenter one second and that is neil all right neil whenever you're ready i am starting the clock right now i've synchronized my watch <laughs> so uh glad to be here happy to be presenting and uh when asked to do this uh, i was asked about a photograph that was meaningful to me and important in my collection which is far more modest than Evans, far more. Um, but when I started collecting, I don't know, some 20, 25 years ago, um, I was kind of uh, collecting in a haphazard manner. And I purchased a photo here, a photo there, uh, but I really didn't have any direction. And I happened to be perusing various gallery websites online and uh, I was on the website for Stephen Data Gallery in Chicago, and I stumbled upon this photo by Yasuhiro Ishimoto, and it caught my eye. Um, I reached out to the gallery, it was sent to me, and I loved it, you know, far more than I loved it online. And uh, I was drawn to the printing and the imagery uh, you see two people that are passing through a glimmer of light that's obviously coming through two buildings. And uh, the way it's printed, it's just exceptionally, the, the dark is just so dark and so rich. And it really wasn't about the importance of this photograph to me, it isn't necessarily about the photo itself, but 
it opened up my eyes to the Institute of Design, uh, which was a school in Chicago uh, that got its start as the new Bauhaus in the late 30s. And uh, it morphed from the new Bauhaus. It was started, the director was Laszlo Moholy Naj. And um, it morphed into the Institute of Design, which became a preeminent school of photography. Um, some of the top names in American photography came out of this, including Harry Callahan and Aaron Siskin, who were uh, teachers there. Um, and my collection is primarily photographs from the Institute of Design, the photographers, uh, Ray Metzger, Kenneth Josephson, uh, Joseph Sterling, uh, Harry Callahan, Aaron Siskin, Art Sinsabaugh, you know, these are really well-known American photographers. And so that's the bulk of my collection, but um, there's a sensibility of the Institute of Design. And while I have other photographers in my collection, their imagery and the printing and the stylus, style, style of those photographs are very much ID photographs. Um, so it was this, this particular photograph just Time's opened up. up a whole new world to me. Time's so, up. That's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you're, Neil. You're, you're strict. Boy. I am. <laughs> Gotta cut it off. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start your two minute Q and A. And if anyone has any questions, um, go ahead and jump in. Neil, uh, you know, we've talked about it before, you know, I'm a big ID fan too, and, yep. and, and we, we occasionally fight over the same photograph. Um, I wonder um, if you have started to explore um, paper choices in, um, in these various photographers. Uh, PGH Photo just posted a, a, a wonderful article um, uh, by Helen, is that right? Helen Trumpeteller, who wrote about Paul Messier and his exploration of papers and mm -hmm. and it's such a fascinating topic I think especially with ID photographers who used um, some papers that are not available anymore because of uh, how the the field has changed so that's something that that has caught your attention I, I have not explored that but you know I know that you know the richness that these images are printed on are clearly attributed to the quality of the paper and um, I guess, you know, the silver content in them. Um, but I have not gone to the depths that you are discussing. Got it. All right, we have time to maybe squeeze in one brief question if anybody wants to go. All right, hot questions, anybody? All righty, well, thank you, Neil. Sure, my pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to go on and to our next presenter who is Chris Fleischner. So Chris, I'm going to start your timer now. Cool, I'm matching on my phone too. Um, thank you everybody. I appreciate the chance to speak with you today about a German photographer named Martin Klimas. And I think this photo is so cool. I, I Maybe you can zoom it in on your individual computers, but it's two porcelain figures that's Kung Fu fighters where the upper half of the body is intact and then the lower half is shattering into all these pieces. And um, I'll explain how he did this later on, but this to me was a milestone in my journey as an art collector. My wife and I had been collecting photography since probably the mid nineties after graduating from college. And we usually focused on what was the subject matter in the photograph. We wanted the aesthetics, the landscape, the people, whatever it was, it was sort of exactly what we were looking at. And PGH Photo helped elevate my interest in just how broad photography is and not just what the subject matter is, but how photographs can be made. And I remember talking to Evan Mirapol a number of years ago, and he was telling me about that aspect of sometimes the way a photograph is made could be fascinating. And sure enough, that that's what drew me to this photographer and uh speaking with uh, Michael Foley from the Foley Gallery, who was at PGH Photo Fair. I think this is such a wonderful juxtaposition of action and stillness. And it 
for me, really represented my kids at that time. They were upper elementary school age and they love each other. They get along great most of the time, but they're also sparring, um, whether verbally or physically as siblings do. And so this has been in different spots in our house over the last seven or eight years in the living room, in my office. Now it's in my son's room. And when I first saw it and every time I look at it, it just sparks this joy. So how do they do this? Well, imagine climbing up a ladder and standing about, holding it about 10 feet off the ground, dropping the figures. And as they fall, they hit the ground and it's a sonically activated shutter. So he rigged his camera system that when the porcelain figure hit the ground, that noise triggered the shutter to take. And so he did this with a number of images and would try it again and again until he got the way he liked it. But it's just, to me, fascinating to understand that, that premise of um, the way he did it, rendering this image that I just found fantastical. And um, I would say that since that time, that was, I think, 2014 or 2015 that I bought this, I've continued to go back to PGH Photo Fair or events like this and just keep learning, keep exploring. And there's so many different paths that each collector can go. But for me, it's just been wonderful to um, have this in Pittsburgh or now we'll get to be virtual. So I want to thank you, Evan, and for everybody that's been part of this because it's really fueled my passion as a collector and uh, my wife's and my family's too. Wow, you're before time. Awesome. Good job. Oh, um, I'm going to start the clock for your Q&A session, which will be two minutes long. So if anyone has a question, you can go ahead and jump in. I'm blushing here, Chris. My gosh, I, I don't think I've ever had uh, such a such a, an advertisement for the fair or uh, or or such kudos in my direction. But thank you very much. Thank you for sure. your years of patronage to the. Well, I have to say, a big part of my collection has come from the galleries from PGH Photo Fair. So thank you. <laughs> yay! Yay! Um, I wonder whether you've explored other um, high shutter speed, fast action sorts of processes. I mean, you know, there's. There's like Doc Edgerton, who is is more or less at the beginning of it, um, but there's also you know new things coming out of MIT that um, explore ultra ultra fast um, shutter speeds. I, I think also uh, the Hillman Photography Initiative had some things that that were um, uh, using gelatin silver prints in the in the in the uh, CERN um, atom collider um, oh, wow. that. Um, that it's for if you're interested in sort of how fast something can be captured on film that's 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 right there yeah i appreciate that i should follow up with you offline for some of those suggestions i haven't followed up with other artists doing high speed shutters because to be honest it was still that aesthetics of like watching the figures that i was drawn to in terms of my kids but i love that idea of exploring further the way technology can do some amazing um, things I forget whether we've had David Solo um, in any of our presentations. He's a collector that I've known for years and years and years. And he went to MIT for computer science and he took a class with Doc Edgerton. Mm. And he said that Doc had an open invitation to any student um, for anything that they wanted to shoot, that um, they should bring it in and they would put a bullet through it and photograph it. Um, and so that always sounded like the absolute best class in the world. So. He said that he's got negatives in a file somewhere of all these things that um, he owned that he got a photograph of a bullet going through them. That's fascinating. Awesome. And with that, it's time actually. Right. Thank so you, thank you, Chris. Thank you for uh, presenting your photograph. I'm gonna go on and move on next to our uh, next presenter who is Cynthia. So Cynthia, if you are ready, I'm going to start your clock right now. Hi, uh, let's see, I uh, have found this photograph uh, with my husband. We tend to search out uh, interesting places, uh, antique shops, flea markets. We go to uh, uh, auctions and this one we found at an antique shop and bought it for about $3. And since then, we've been trying to figure out if there's anyone that we could pin it on, that we could figure out who took this. It's a uh, American modernist uh, photograph uh, about uh, eight by 10. 
and it's of two men stoking coal and they were probably putting it in a boiler uh, for, uh, they were most likely posing. There were a number of advertisements that were done doing uh, this kind of work. And there were other people who did uh, similar uh, photographs. Uh, you can see this one. This is a Lewis Hine. Uh, he's uh, well known for children photographing children who uh, were uh, in um, uh, work situations that were very unpleasant. Another one here is by Margaret Burke White. It's Women at Work. And this was a sugar refinery in uh, Scotland back in 1920. These are all 1920, 1930s. Charles Sheeler was an advertising photographer and he uh, did uh, similar and uh, Edward Weston also did uh, Armco Steel in Ohio. And these are all American um, modernist, uh, very graphic, very uh, high contrast photographs that were done uh, to encourage people uh, during wartime that uh, women could work, men could work. Uh, we like to buy photographs or come by them from people that uh, we don't necessarily know, but a friend of ours, Nathan Lyons up at Visual Studies Workshop has kind of guided us to some photographs. Uh, we collect black and white. Nathan uh, died several years ago, but we used to go to auctions to support visual studies workshop where I was on the board. And that uh, for oh, 40, 45 years, we've been collecting mostly photographs, sometimes art. So uh, I thank you for allowing me to share this with you. All right, thank you. Um, you're right on time. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start your Q&A. So if anyone has a question, you can go ahead and jump in right now. Any questions? I actually, actually, I have a question. I'm curious as to know, like, um, how big is this photograph, actually, since I know you found it, like, in an antique shop? I'm sorry. How say... large? What's the dimensions of it? Like, how big is it? Oh, uh, it's not terribly big at all. It's about eight by 10. I have it here. Oh, okay, uh, wow. Oh, beautiful. Maybe eight and a half by 11. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Awesome. And can you, where were you in, um, when you found it? Like, was it a specific it, city was, or is it in Pittsburgh? Uh, in New York uh, uh -huh. on uh, Route uh, 511, uh, <clears throat> going horizontally through the state. And we went through many of them. Uh, antiquing for furniture for our house some and poking in the bins. And this is uh, just one that uh, we found. And when we uh, were so eager to buy it, perhaps showed too much eager, I think the uh, uh, owner uh, who had second thoughts about selling it, but oh, yeah. uh, uh, we, uh, it was framed too when, yeah. when we got it. Nice. Awesome. Thank Oregon. you. Oregon. Gotcha. Um, any other questions? I see there's something in the chat. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. I was wondering if Cindy could uh, tell us what she likes about that image because it's an extraordinary image, at least from my perspective. Well, the, uh, composition of and the uh, contrast and certainly the uh, muscular identity of the men is uh, something that appealed to me uh, when we found it. Uh, they're uh, certainly into their, uh, their work, their uh, not necessarily gritting, they're smiling. Uh, so I think it's partially posed because I don't think they've been doing that for uh, six to eight or 10 hours. Uh, there's no sweat rolling down their arms and they're in front of a, a blazing light, but right, it's- Time's uh, up. Your two minutes are up. 
Cynthia. All right, thank you. I thank know that you. there's one more question in the chat. We can maybe address it at the end of the present and at the end of everyone's presentations. So I'm gonna go on and move on next to our next presenter who is Claire. All right, Claire, if you're ready, I'm gonna go ahead and start your clock right now. Okay, hey. hi everyone. Um, I found this photomatic print at a flea market in Raleigh, North Carolina, but according to what's written on the back, it was made at Rolling Green Park, which is an amusement park located in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. The park is long gone, but by all accounts, it was a lot like, say, um, Westview or Kennywood Park near Pittsburgh. And speaking of, this photograph has become a lot more relevant to me over the past two years while I've been processing and digitizing the Kennywood Park Records collection. This photograph, like many in the collection, is an artifact of a vibrant but flawed era for amusement parks and recreation and leisure in America. What attracted me to this print though in the first place was the aluminum frame that gives it that kind of object quality. And I was also amused to see that it had traveled about 500 miles south from where it was made nearly 80 years earlier. But the most intriguing aspect to me was the combination of the subject's melancholy yet kind of haunting expression and the splashes of pink and yellow color, which was likely applied by hand. Um, as an artist and archivist, I always have created and collected with a focus on photographic forms. And machines like the one that produced this portrait were patented in 1925. In my opinion, they, photo booths, deserve more credit as a pivotal photographic innovation because it brought the sitter and the finished product closer together than ever before. And instead of handing over film to be processed and picking up prints later, a portrait could be had in minutes. Of course, those few minutes were surpassed um, with the introduction of Polaroid instant film. Unlike a lot of technology from the 1920s, though, the photo booth didn't entirely succumb to obsolescence. It really adapted. And as of today, the ones that do exist utilize a digital process. So this all really comes full circle recently whenever I made portraits in the photo booth at Kennywood Park with one of my best friends. And I can't say that the quality really matches up to a photomatic print, but knowing my experience was the same or very similar as it always has been for people, um, you know, fun and memorable is just an especially sweet thing. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Claire. You're actually a little early on time. Awesome. All right. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and start your two minutes. Um, and I'm going to start right now. And there is somebody who said something in the chat. Um, the image is very Caravaggio-esque and offers a rich reading in terms of Roland Barthes' experience of photography in his book, Camera Lucida, including in terms of the puncture of the outer frame seen only by the two workers who double, double us as the viewer who have no access to the outer frame. I think that's about the previous photo. That must be photo. about the previous photo? Okay, all right, yeah. sorry about that. All right, we can go on and move on to questions. Um, if anyone has any questions and wants to jump in. If, if anybody is as fascinated as I am by um, the history of the photo book, there is this book. I, I don't know if I'm on camera or not. Uh, can you everyone are. see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it's, a, it's an amazing history of the photo booth. And um, it's, 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 it's interesting how many artists, you know, um, before and after Warhol had thought the photo booth was just a, an in, incredible tool um, and, and whether it was just people like this woman at an amusement park or artists using it in very particular ways. It's, it's, a, it's, a remarkable, it's a remarkable thing. And what was that book called? American yeah. Photo Booth. Thanks. Claire, this is Chris. I really enjoyed seeing this image and it just struck me because nowadays in a photo booth, people will be smiling or hamming it up or doing something and here they're so serious and I'm, I don't know when people kind of made that switch from staid to silly, but it's, you know, it's fun to sort of see somebody taking themselves so seriously in a way that I wouldn't expect anymore. Yeah, you know, I was wondering that myself and I feel like maybe because of her age, she doesn't appear to be super young or anything like 
maybe that's left over from the previous era of where you would go to the studio and like sit, you know, have a tin type taken or something just less common to smile. I don't know. Um, I briefly looked up uh, what was happening during that time, 1937. Um, so unemployment, people were getting more jobs, more work. Maybe there was a little less pressure there. Um, there's some other events that was, you know, it's interesting because that's a, a piece of history there. I just wanted to state that. There's also um, uh, an incredible series of photographs. Uh, if I can find a link real quick, I'll put it in the chat um, of the Dadaists using um, a photo booth in Paris, um, always with their eyes closed and not smiling. And I think that there's portraits of, of, um, of all of them uh, at various times using the photo booth to We're take a picture time. with their eyes closed. Oh, well, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Great, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next presenter who is Christine. So Christine, if you're ready, I'm gonna go ahead and start your clock right now. Okay, um, this is my print of Edward Weston's Half an Onion. And um, I come at it from kind of two different, several different places. Um, I'm really ultimately an art history nerd. Um, I have an under, undergrad degree in art history. I'm also really a print nerd. And I didn't understand what was happening to me when I walked into a photo class in high school. So I was 15 years old and I fell in love with the dark room and I ruined multiple clothes from fixer and all sorts of things. I stunk like high heaven for years as I was like doing photos in the dark room. And my teacher would had such a huge influence on me. And he would show us these images that I just had no idea what they were, but they were like really simple objects, really amazing things. And I didn't understand, um, you know, the gift that he was giving me, but Weston, of course, is part of F64. F64 is named for the f-stop and the camera that would give the biggest depth of field, which is the bit, the most clarity of image. So this image, you know, you can look at it as an onion. Sometimes I get lost at lost, and I'm wondering if it's a maze or a road. And um, you, you know, it's just like all these different things in there, but you have to really understand the context. He was coming out of a pictorialist tradition. So to slice open an onion and decide that it is worthy of an image is absolutely remarkable. Of course, there were 10 other people in F64 and the other group. We have about 40 or so images of F64 in our collection. Um, but this really is, um, you know, one of my favorites, the nerd in me loves the fact that it's signed, it's initialed, it's mounted. All of those things are things that you want when you're looking for a Weston image. And so this was very special when I found that in this picture, um, it's been an image that I've loved for a long time. I think that there are two other vintage pictures, prints of this picture, um, but he was also looking at the onion as art. He was starting to number them. And that again is like really unusual, really wildly weird and new for that time period. Um, one of the other ways it appeals to me is um, some people know that I'm a bit of an obsessive salsa maker. So um, like this time of year, I'm slicing up onions like crazy. In the next month, I'll probably can about 400 jars of salsa. So this is a very familiar um, image to me just in my real life. But it's um, it, it just strikes all these different chords in me. And I, I keep on looking at it through all these different lenses. Please excuse the pun. And um, it's one of the things that keeps it alive for me. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Christine. You had five seconds to spare. Wow. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to your questions area. So your two minutes are going to start now. So if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and jump in. Actually, let's see. I wonder how many other photographs you collect uh, and do they all have this graphic and maze like quality or are your photographs different? <laughs> um, we, we have about 1300 pictures in our collection. Um, 
And I would say that there's a strong common element of formalism in many of them, um, but not necessarily to the level of this graphicness. It's, it's interesting how many pictures were chosen today that do have this really strong graphical quality from, uh, from the co-workers to the uh, to Neil's picture of uh, uh, Ishimoto and this Weston. I mean, there's, there's this incredible through line. I'm not sure how they're related other than that, but, uh, but it's interesting that we've, 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 we found this thread. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. Yeah. Great. We have time for one brief question if anyone wants to jump in. All right, well, thank you so much, Christine. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next presenter who I believe is our last presenter. Um, and that is Brian Lang. So Brian, whenever you're ready, I'm going to start your clock right now. Thanks, Erica. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be talking about um, an artist tonight who is not really a photographer and a work that he created that wasn't created by him. So Dario Robledo is an artist who I became interested in about 10 years ago, who is really a multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary artist best known for creating installations. Um, out of his primary interests in music, space, and history for the most part. And he uses uh, disparate objects such as vinyl records, dinosaur bones, meteorites, um, and down to early recordings of heartbeats to create installations that really talk about the collective, um, humanity's collective history. Um, two interesting things about Dario is that he's also interested in neuroscience and has been studying the brain's reaction to um, conceptual art. So that's one project that he's been working on, which led him to become an artist in residence with SETI, which is the search for intellect, search for extraterrestrial intelligence in Mountain View, California, um, specifically working on the Breakthrough Message Project, which is an effort to create technical and intellectual dialogue around what the message should be that is sent if we ever come into contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. And that sort of leads me to this piece, this set of inkjet prints that he created, which are <clears throat> album covers of deceased musicians, such as John Coltrane, Jimi Hendrix, Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, the Mamas and the Papas. And what he did was he borrowed these images and digitally removed the, um, the portraits of the artists from the album covers. So what you're left with is the images of the light, <clears throat> the background lighting on the stage, but they appear to be photographs of celestial objects, almost NASA-like images. So the point of this project was to say in, in very simple terms that even though these artists are deceased, their memory lives on and their stars shine on. So what, what I really loved about this project, um, <clears throat> aside just being a huge fan of, of Dario's work, is that the, the work is so relatable it came out of a larger group of photographs that he did based on these album covers of deceased musicians, which culminated in this specific set of prints. And for the audience that I'm dealing with, with which is primarily an employee audience um, at the corporation where I work, um, it was just a, a project that was so relatable. Everybody can relate to music, everybody appreciates music, and the imagery is so powerful um, with the star-like images or celestial body-like images in the background, that it's been uh, it's been a big hit in uh, the collection that I manage. So that's that's the work. Awesome. All right, thank you so much, Brian. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start your Q and A section. So your two minutes are starting now. And if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and jump in. And I've got a question. It's Chris. Are these, when you're displaying this in the bank, is it meant to be a three by three grid or do you have it sort of distributed throughout 
with more of his works? That's a good question, Chris. We've displayed it both ways. We've displayed it in grid and in a straight line. Um, it's, it's really interesting in a grid, which is how it's shown here, but the, the individual images which are labeled when they're displayed so you know which album cover you're looking at, um, you know, it, it works either way. I think it has you know, great power no matter how you display it. We've also displayed images outside of the grid, outside of the group. Um, so Dario, Dario created um, these images and further images as single larger prints, um, but also created the set of prints. So they were meant to be viewed um, both individually or as a group as they're shown here. All right, we have time for one more question. Brian, I think this is such a this is such a cool set. Um, um, I'm reminded of that uh, Penelope Umbraco um, series about uh, found images of uh, of sunsets, which I've also bought. <laughs> oh, there you go. Do you show them together? Uh, it's a single image. It's a multiple. It's a collage of about a couple hundred images of. Um, people taking their portraits against a sunset, so their silhouettes black. Um, so if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he's, he, you said that he's interested in neuroscience and I, you know, I, I know that there's something about the brain that sees a human face in, in abstract patterns, even when there's no face there. Um, and knowing that Penelope did her piece based on the idea that the sun is the most photographed thing on um, online. I think on Pinterest, there's, there's more pictures of sunsets than anything right. else by the millions and millions and millions. And so I think it's fascinating that immediately our brains go to the idea that it's, that it's a sun, even though right. it's not, right? And I wonder whether he explored that in his, you know, whether that was part of his thinking when he, when he, when he was going for it, that he Time. knew that it would go. Okay, now it's time for Brian's. And then it looks like that is the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up one final Q&A um, for the whole panel to uh, participate in and for anybody who might have any questions about any of the pieces that were presented tonight or about collecting in general um, or how they got interested in collecting, you can go ahead and uh, ask your questions. If anyone has any questions. Um, Alexander uh, so, asked, oh, go yeah, ahead, Evan. Go, go ahead, Erica. Uh, I was just gonna um, read a question from the chat. Alexander asked, what was the sunset piece that was just mentioned? Brian, go ahead. It's, um, it's actually a series and body of work by an artist who I believe is Canadian, is that right? Named Penelope. Uh, I, I, I thought she was American, but I don't know. She may be. Her, her name is Penelope, Penelope Umbrico, U-M-B-R-I-C-O. Um, and she's done, um, you know, appropriated images from Instagram and, and, and Pinterest um, and created huge collages of images that other people have created of sunsets, taking pictures of sunsets. Um, she's done other work as well besides, besides sunsets, but that's the thing she's best known for, I think. Yep. Hi, um, we had a question for Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, you said something really interesting about how your taste in photography kind of changed. And instead of just taking pictures, uh, liking pictures of topics that you enjoyed, you kind of started to like photographs and how they were made. And we were wondering, was that kind of linear? Like, did you then shift your focus and focus more on the way photograph you know, photographs are made? Or do you still continue to buy photographs of things that you like? Both, both my girls had that question. Yeah, no, thank you. Great question. I think I'm still drawn primarily to subject matter. Um, I think that we, I had been initially collecting mostly black and white photography and then shifted to color. And so to this day, I'm probably mostly collecting photography, but with certain artists, I really love um, some of the way they do black and white, especially some of the older photographers. Historically, that was their technology and understanding that medium's great. I haven't had a chance yet, maybe as the kids get older and I can do the empty nest to really delve more into the photography processes. Um, but I've also used some of the galleries from PGH Photo Fair to learn and be guides because they're wonderful in helping introduce me to artists or Don and me to artists and letting us understand how it's such a varied landscape, how it all plays together. And then as they ask us questions, they can help steer us in different directions. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Happy collecting to you and your family. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to address a question that was in the chat from Cynthia's presentation. Actually, um, someone asked this right at the end of your presentation. Um, have you tried reverse image search on Google for your photograph to find any details on it? No, I haven't tried a reverse image search. I've mm -hmm. uh, done a lot of searching by year. I've searched by uh, type of photography. I've spoken to some photographic historians. Uh, I spoke to Nathan before he died about this photograph, and he really felt it was uh, uh, done as a uh, advertisement. Uh, and he suggested a couple of people for me to look up, but uh, they weren't, they didn't have that image. But I could try that next. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting how something can seem so um formally clear that it has to show its authorship and yet and yet not on on my first image the one from 1853 it's clearly from some extremely high end studio um and and it's an unusually large portrait from the period um and it's been looked at by i don't know how many like it's the 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 national gallery of toronto and the smithsonian and moma i mean i've had every the met i've had every high level curator look at it thinking that somebody will recognize the rug or the backdrop or or something about it or or i've even talked to like philadelphia historians who maybe recognize the little girl and we all think it's findable, but so far we just can't, even though I think that Cynthia's photograph to it, it seems so clear of a, such a clear style that you'd think that you could find it, but then it just kind of always stays just out of reach. Yeah, that elusive butterfly. <laughs> Are there any other questions? questions? Maybe no. No, no other questions? OK, so before we close the event this evening, I wanted to ask everyone who feels comfortable to to turn on your cameras, because we'd like to take a little screenshot for our social media platforms and to just show everyone how much of a good time we had. So if you don't mind turning on your cameras. And all right. Cool, thank you everyone. Look at all these faces. Wait, Erica, do we also need to do one like Claire's picture where everybody's just... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> everyone's just like very <laughs> posed. Yeah, all, all right, good. everybody, eyes closed. Eyes closed, you know, camera's off, obviously. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, our next and final event for the photo fair is our speaker series event with Azoldi Braumar, which is going to be on September 15th, which is a Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, we're going to have RSVPs open to the public next week. They will be announced on our social media and our newsletters. So we'll be able to sign up um, through either of those avenues. And thank you again so much for joining us tonight. And thank you again to our presenters. Thank you, Evan. And have a lovely evening, everyone. And the uh, the Q and A from the book that Dan and I did about about our project is going to be on the PGH Photo website in the next week. Awesome! Thank, Thank you all for taking the time to come this evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you everyone. All. Thanks, all right, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.